prayer. But uh, I'm thankful that we are a praying church, and hopefully we have praying people. Is you'll never regret an hour spent in prayer. I promise. All right, we'll dismiss the Sunday school. Thank you, Rudy, for that wonderful song. Thank you, Julian. And thank you all for being here. We're opening our Bible now. It's wonderful to have some visitors with us today. We want to invite everybody to be able to stay with us after church for a cup of tea or coffee or biscuit or a Romanian chocolate. Or both, or all three. But uh, we also invite you to sign our guest book at the back. It's great to have Andrew and Jennifer and little Nathan with us this morning. Don't want to embarrass you all, but it's great to have you here today. And uh, we want to make you very welcome. All right, let's turn to Ephesians again this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We've been looking together at the theme of our new year, which is redeeming the time. Uh, which we find in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. But as part of that, we've been looking at the, at the general book of Ephesians. And the sermons that I've been preaching on Sundays have been sort of, they've not been looking at just one verse, but they've sort of been sweeping sermons, looking at whole subjects in this book of Ephesians. We've looked at how to redeem the time when it comes to uh, our finances, and when it comes to, we're going to look next week at our, our family, and when it comes to, uh, when it comes to our work. Today we're going to look at that, when it comes to our work. The book of Ephesians has a lot to say about work. Redeeming the time when it comes to our work. Now, our greatest example of this is God himself. God himself is a God who works. So this morning I like to look at the work of God, whether it's the work of God that he does, or whether, whether it's the work of God that he lets us be a part of. And are you part of God's wonderful work? God has a work in this world. He's working. And we're never more like God than we, we are working for the right reasons for him. Uh, some people are allergic to the word work. Uh, but work is not a bad thing. Work was, work was taking place by God himself. When he, when he was working to create this world. The, we, look, we, we sing about the works of God. When we sang, How Great Thou Art, um, I, the reason I picked that is because I thought it had the word works in it, but it used to. Originally it said, O oh Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, it used to say, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Of course, it's translated from, I think, Swedish. So somebody else has translated the worlds that hands have made, but just the same. Think of all the worlds, all the works of God. And we just are amazed at, at what he's done, at, about his power. But then, of course, he created you and me, our world. He created our world. He created you and me in it. He created man. Man is sort of the, the peak of his works. And he gave us a living soul that will live forever with him somewhere. We're created in his image. And he gave Adam work to do before the curse. <laughs> Some people think work, uh, work is a curse, but work was around before the curse. It's just, it was all fulfilling work. There's nothing more satisfying and more fulfilling than doing work for God and for him for the right reasons. Uh, but... He gave Adam a task. He created Adam outside of the Garden of Eden, in the wilderness somewhere, in this world. And then, after he created Adam, he planted a garden, and he put Adam in the garden to dress it and to keep it, to do something for God, to bear some fruit for God. You and I are bearing different kind of fruit. We're bearing spiritual fruit, whether it's in, in the lives of others, witnessing to them, uh, in, in our children, the Bible calls children the fruit of the womb. Um, we're, we're bearing fruit by passing along the knowledge of God to other generations and to the people around us. We're bearing fruit. The Bible, Jesus said to his disciples, he said uh, in John chapter 15, he talks about bearing fruit. And he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth 
much fruit. So he talks about bearing fruit, and then he talks about bearing much fruit. And then he says, um, if you want to bear much fruit, you have to let, let it be cleanse you. He says, if you're cleansed, you can bear more fruit. So some people, some Christians have no fruit. Some Christians have fruit, but not very much. Some people have more fruit, and some people have much fruit. So Jesus in John 15 talks about those four levels of, of Christians. Which level are you? Are you working for God? Are you bearing fruit? Are you in the garden that God's put you in? God put Adam in a garden, and he did fulfilling work. Where, where has God planted you? I remember when I was in Sunday school, there was a bulletin board on the back wall, and it said, had pictures of tulips on it, and it said, bloom where God has planted you. You know, God's planted us all somewhere, and you have a work to do, whether it's in your family or in your neighborhood or in your school, perhaps, the young people, or in your workplace, or in your church. God likes his work to be done through the local church in this dispensation. And all of these opportunities God gives us to work for him. But it all goes back to him and his, his character. First of all, we see the work of God that he does. And then we're going to look at the work of God that he allows us to be a part of here in the book of Ephesians. So, what is God doing? What's the work that God does? Look at chapter 1, verse 19. It says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, in the heavenly places. So it talks in verse 15 about the working of his mighty power. When God works, things get done. He has mighty power. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. And whatever he does stays done. The, the devil, what the devil does can be undone. But what God does in your life as far as salvation and making you a saint, that can never be undone. It's forever. It's eternal life. He makes you a saint, and you'll be a saint forever and ever. Think of eternity. Eternity is a little word, but it has such an amazing meaning. And God makes us saints, what he does by his mighty power. So it talks here. In, uh, the, 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 the word right before verse 19 is the word saints. <coughs> the word saints. You also see the word saints in verse 1 of chapter 1. You also see it in verse 15 of chapter 1. So he's praying for these saints. He says, Wherefore uh, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So first of all, he talks about how God worked by his mighty power by making us saints. Our, our second point in the sermon is that God worked to make you servants after you were made saints. But first of all, he says God worked to make you saints. If you look at uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, you'll see the second point. It says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. He says, I made a minister. The word minister means a servant. So he said, God made me a servant by the working of his power. So God's working in your life. Is God working in your life? He wants to. He wants to do a work in your life. The first work is to make you a saint. The second work, after you're a saint, is to make you a servant. You might say, well, I'm no saint. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners, but we need to be SS, you know, saved sinners. <laughs> uh, not the SS that you think of in the military, but uh, but we need. Are you an are you a saved sinner? Are you a saint? Uh, he says in verse one to the saints which are at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. All of all of you, if you're born again, you've been made a saint. You don't have to wait until the the white smoke comes from the chimney and they. You have to be so many years dead and and all of that. That's that's what the some people say you have to do to become a saint, but. It's not something you do. It's not they uh, in the Catholic Church. You have to perform a miracle to become a saint. But 
in the Bible, God's the one who performs the miracle in you to make you a saint. Amen. And God has performed a miracle in, in working in your life to make you a saint. So I'm looking at Saint Michael back there. I'm looking at Saint Claire and Saint Marita and Saint George. Saint George, that's pretty good. You know, you could be our patron saint of uh, England. No, but all of, all of these saints I'm looking at, but it's not in ourselves. It's in God. It says here, how does he do this work in your life? It says he wrought, he, he wrought it in Christ, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Of all the works that God's done, making the universe just spreading out the star, the Bible just says in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, and he made the stars also. No sweat to God. Uh, the Bible says he made the stars with the span of his hand. And that's how much power he has. Just think of the vastness of the universe. I think he put all those stars there just to show us how big and powerful he is. Uh, of course, I know that the gravitational field of all the universe, if, there, if all the stars weren't just where they are, then Earth wouldn't be just where it is, just the right distance from the sun. And all of that gravity works together, but I believe he really put it, the vastness of space there just to remind us of his power. And yet, the Bible says the greatest thing he does is what he did in Christ, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of the church over all things, a, a head, to the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, that filleth all in all. Can you just see the crescendo there of the work that Christ has done and that God's done in Christ coming and making this, this, this church and putting Christ as the head over the church? And he's building this church. That's his work. And he's making saints. So all of that God's doing. God's working. Now sometimes we, we, we like to separate chapters in the Bible, but look at the next verse, chapter 2, verse 1. He's talking about all this mighty power that God has done, has in, in raising Christ from the dead, but why did he do it? And then it says, and you, verse 1 of chapter 2, and you hath he quickened. So he did all this power, he showed all this power at the resurrection. Think of the power of the resurrection. We're, we're we're coming up to Easter in a couple months, but are we living in the light of the resurrection every single day and the power of Christ's resurrection? That's why he did it. He did it for you and you, hath he quickened. So he raised Christ from the dead so that he could also raise you from the dead. You hath he quickened, made alive, in other words, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Think of God's resurrection power. He had power to give you life. He had power to give Adam the breath of life. He has power to give you spiritual life that will last forever. This physical life lasts such a short time. The book of Psalms, chapter 90, says, uh, if by reason of strength, you know, it says usually people live about three score and ten, which is 70. But if by reason of strength four score years, then is there strength, labor, and sorrow. So there's lots of labor and sorrow in this life, and, but it's over so quickly. Maybe 80 years. If you live to be 80 years, you live 29,200 days. That's not very many. It's, it, and, and the thing about time is, you can't get it back. If you lose money, you can earn it back. If you lose, uh, if you lose your, I know Ambrose lost his mobile phone. He's going to get a new mobile phone. If you lose uh, a child, you know, you can't get that child back, but you, you see them again in heaven. Of course, God can give more children, but they don't replace the old other children. But, but these things that, that can be lost, God can replace in one way or another. But time, he cannot replace. Time, once it's gone, it's gone. So that's why we need to be redeeming the time. But we only have this life to get ready for eternity. This short life. People have this life. And what they do with Christ in this life affects them forever and ever and ever. Amen. Also, after they get saved, how they serve the Lord affects their eternal life also. 
It affects the rewards you get in eternity. It affects the positions that you'll have in eternity. Jesus talks about the good steward who, if they were faithful in little, they'll be responsible for much in heaven, in eternity, in the, in the millennial kingdom of Jesus and, and beyond, into eternity, in heaven. And so he says, you were faithful, I'll put you in charge of ten cities. You were faithful with five, I'll put you in charge of five cities. So somehow, somehow that's going to affect uh, eternity. So this little life, you have this chance to be saved, and yet just this one opportunity uh, for it to happen. Uh, but, but we need to come to Christ during this time. It says, and you hath he quickened, who in, wherein in times past walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of obedience. So God does this amazing miracle. He stepped into time, out of eternity, to do this miracle of saving us. Um, but it's not by, how, how do we do this? It's God's work in our life. It's God's work. Look at verse 8 of chapter 2. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation, making you a saint, is God's work. So many people, so many religions, in fact, all man-made religions, I could, I could dare to say, put the cart before the horse, they get this backwards. They think they go to heaven by good works. They think they can climb the ladder like, uh, like the Tower of Babel, you know. Uh, and that was the first false religion in the Bible, the Tower of Babel. They thought they could build a tower to heaven. That's not going to happen. If you saw somebody outside tonight jumping up and down, and they, you asked them, what are you doing? And they said, well, I'm trying to grab that star up there. You'd say, you're crazy. Uh, but that's what people think. They can reach heaven by their own good works, but heaven is perfect. We're not. You cannot get there by good works. So it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the verse that my dad heard in Chicago when he became a, the first Christian in his family, which was the opposite of what the priest had told him as an altar boy in the Netherlands. He had said, just be a good boy. If your good works that way, your bad works will go to heaven. If your bad works that way, your good works will go to hell. But don't ask any questions. And then my dad moved to Chicago and somebody read to him this verse. And he was learning English. He didn't really know uh, he learned, my dad learned English by watching John Wayne movies with Dutch subtitles. But uh, he never learned the words like grace or faith or saved. So, uh, but at that church they had donuts afterwards and he, they said, you can ask any question you want afterwards. So he, is, uh, he asked, what, he knew not of works was the opposite of what the priest had said. So he had lots of questions. He said, what is, how, do you, how are you saved then? And eventually he understood what grace and saved and faith meant in that verse he trusted Christ and God did a work in his life God did a work in his family and uh, he raised his children to know the truth of the gospel as well and I personally put my faith in Christ when I was five but that was not me doing anything good it was God doing that in my life so God does a work in making us saints but then God does a work in making us servants look at uh, verse 10 of chapter 2 it says for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them so he does the work in our life to make us a saint but then he gives us the he turns it around and says okay now you can do good works so many people are trying to please God with their good works but until they're saved all of their righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Their works don't even count. People think that they're earning brownie points with God to get to heaven, but they don't even count. It's not even about that. Salvation is not about that at all. It's about, have you trusted in Christ's finished work on the cross? He said it is finished. And so there's two types of religion. There's do, 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 or there's done. Jesus said it is finished. So he's done all the work for salvation. Now he turns around and says, out of gratitude, you now can work for me and please me and have a fulfilling life uh, for me. And so that's why, why we are saved. So it may sound like semantics when you're trying to explain it to people, but it's the most important thing in the world. 
It's not saved by works, you're saved unto good works. Uh, God says he's before ordained that we should walk in them. He has a plan for your life. God has a wonderful plan for your life. God gives us life, he gives us new life, and he has a plan for it. God has works that he's ordained for you to do. Are you doing those, those good works? Are, are you living as the Christian that God saved you to be? God's, we're saved to serve in some way. We're saved to serve. Uh, and, and Paul says this. He says God not only builds, makes you into a saint, he builds you into a servant. And that's what he says here in, in, in the book of Ephesians. He says in chapter 3, verse 7, we've already said, where, Paul said, whereof I was made a minister, a servant, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me. According, I'm sorry, by the effectual working of his power. Jesus said in John 15, without me you can do nothing. If you want to serve God in your own strength, you can't do it. We're not saved by good works. We're saved by faith. And the Bible says also in the book of Habakkuk, the just should be living by faith as well. Paul said to the Galatians, he said, are you so foolish? Do you think that what was begun in the spirit you can finish according to the flesh? And so many times we were saved by God's spirit and yet then we want to live our Christian lives by our own flesh, by our own power, by our own strength, you can't do it. You'll get tired. You'll get, uh, you'll, you'll get burnt out. You'll get weary in well-doing. You'll faint. You'll, the Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. But if we do it in our own strength, we'll faint. So how do we, how do we, uh, how are we becoming, how do we become servants like Jesus was? It's according to, the, to his effectual working in our life. According to the effectual working of his power. It works. It's effectual. It always works. If you look to him, you'll get the strength you need. If you look to him, you'll get the guidance you need of what you're supposed to be doing. Look to him and, and seek him. Seek his strength. But he says, there was a gift given to me, verse 7. Uh, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me. He was given a, a certain gift. Uh, what was his gift? He was given the gift of being an apostle. But what's, all of us have different gifts. Look at verse 8. He says, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. Remember, he was a murderer. He used to kill the Christians. So he... he had a humble view of himself, but we should all have that view. I am nothing without Christ. I am less than the least. So less of the least of the saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so he says that's what the gift that was given to me is, was. But he says all of us have certain gifts. Um, he speaks about that. Here, in this chapter, he says uh, down in verse number uh, 15, he says, uh, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He says there's this family, uh, and, and God gives each person in the family different gifts. He talks about in chapter uh, 2 how God's building us up into a building. So three things God is building in, in his work. First of all, in the book of Ephesians, it says he's making a building. Look at chapter 2, it, it says that um, in verse 20, it says, You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The Bible uses this illustration all throughout the New Testament, how we are a building. We're built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And then on that was the apostles and the word of God. And we're, he's still building this building. There's no temple anymore. There's no building that you have to go to to worship God. We are a building. The, we're the temple of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. 
So we are a building. When you come to church, the church is not the building. You know, when I talk about the church, I always make sure when I'm talking about I'm going to the church, I always say I'm going to the church building if I'm coming here by myself. Uh, but if you're all here, then I can say I'm going to church because we are the church. This body that is the church it doesn't have to have a big uh, cathedral. That's, you know, that's nothing to God. You know, the Peterborough Cathedral is 900 years old. But to God, I don't know if I'm misquoting this, but the Bible says that, that a day, a thousand day, a thousand years is as a day to God. So the Peterborough Cathedral is not even a day old yet. <laughs> so, but God's not impressed with buildings. He's impressed with what he is building. Uh, his work in our lives, making us into saints and into servants. So he's making a building. And he puts all of us as part of that. Secondly, he's making a body. He's making a building. He's making a body. Look at chapter 4. And verse number 13. He, I mentioned those gifts that he gives. Look at verse 11, actually, of chapter 4. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teacher, teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He's making a whole body, and he gives different gifts. We're all different bricks in the body, but we're also, he uses this illustration, we're different members of a body. And elsewhere, he talks about how the foot doesn't say to the hand, I can't believe you have a better position than me, and all this. The foot doesn't get jealous of the, of the, of the pinky. You know. We all have a different gift. We all have a different place in the body. But we, sh we, we all have a purpose to serve. He says, uh, verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual working, there's that word working again, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. God's making a perfect body. We're the body of Christ. Christ's physical body ascended up off of the Mount of Olives and went back to heaven. But he left you and me here to do a certain work. If you have been left here, you still have a work to do. If you're still alive, you still have a work to do in God's body. You know, God could have just, as soon as you said, God save me, forgive me of my sins, by faith I trust Christ as my Savior, God could have said, there you go, he has eternal life, let's bring him on up to heaven. You know, but that didn't happen, he left you here. Why? For a reason. You're supposed to be doing part of his work in this world. He's not here to do his work physically, but he does his work through the church. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are supposed to be doing his work. There's a work for you to do, whether it's a praying work or a, a, a speaking work, speaking to somebody or a, encouraging somebody or, or giving something to someone. We all have a, a different gift of encouragement or a, of, of speaking or of uh, he talks here about the teaching gifts in verse 11. God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are a certain gift that God gave, but there's also uh, other parts, other gifts that are given. And uh, we've spoken about that before. Verse uh, 7 of chapter 4 says, Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every one of us has some gift from God that we can be a part of God's work somehow. And if you're still alive, you still have a gift to give to the body of Christ. The third thing is he's making not only a building and a body, he's making a bride. Look at chapter 5, verse 26. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the wash... I'm sorry, verse 25. I'm sorry, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle 
or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blemish. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So marriage is just a picture of the ultimate marriage, Christ and the church. We are his bride. Uh, God did a, is doing a work in seeking a bride. Remember, God, uh, Abraham sent his servant Eleazar to find a wife for Isaac. And uh, God led him to just the right person, you know, but uh, to the person who, who God wanted him to marry. But, you know, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seeking a bride for Christ. Jesus said, I'm going, but when I go, the Holy Spirit will come, and he will, uh, he'll be pointing people to me. He's not going to speak about himself. He's going to be pointing people to me. And that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's pointing people to the bride, become part of the bride. And one day we'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. All together. We'll, we'll be perfect then. We'll be a glorious church, as this verse says, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We'll be holy. We'll be without blemish. That's only through Christ. Through the washing of the water by the Word. When the Word of God comes in, uh, God does a work through His Word. God's work is, li is quick and powerful. It's living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a living book, and it's, it is a book that does God, God uses to do His work. So when God's Word is preached, uh, the washing comes in through, through faith in what the Word of God says. So has God done that work in your life? Has He made you a saint? Has He made you a servant? Are you, has He making you part of His building, part of His body, part of His bride? Has he done that in your life? God wants to do that effectual working of his mighty power in your life. God can do it. God can do it. He has so much power. Chapter 3, verse 20 says, Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God can change your life in a way that you never even would have thought of. He's that powerful. But now that we are a servant, we should try to be the best servant that we can be. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. What, what's this word vocation? We all have a different occupation or a different work for the Lord. You know, this is the greatest work in the world. God has a work assigned to you, a task, a vocation for you to do. Um, you know, if, if you are still alive, there's yet more work to do. You know, you might retire from your vocational work, but you'll never retire from God's work. You know, in fact, if you retire, you may have uh, a, a revival of God's work. You have more time for God, even, you know, when you retire. You might not have as much energy, but you have an urgency, realizing the time is short, and that the work that is going to be done has to be done quickly. He talks about this vocation. He says it also in, in uh, chapter <coughs> 4, verse 7. We all have, as we've already read, we all have different graces given, different occupations, different gifts. But what's your vocation? Are you working for God? You know, we're not supposed to do, we're supposed to do this worthily. If you're working for God, do it in a way that is a good representative of Him. If you're working for Him, you are representing Him. Don't, don't live like you used to. Look at what the Gentiles do. Look at chapter 4, verse uh, 19. It says, talks about, don't walk like the Gentiles walked. And then he says, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. The work that, that, uh, that Gentiles, that unsaved people, in other words, do, they work all uncleanness, with greediness. We're selfish people. Our sinful nature is selfish. It's all about us. We're greedy. We work for ourselves. We work to make money. We work, uh, you know, we, we, we're supposed to work to make money to, do, to use it for the right motives, to be able to take care of our family, to be able to, to do more work for God. And, uh, but we're not supposed to do it out of greediness. It's supposed to be all for the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. But if it becomes greediness then you're just working on cleanness. That's not how we're supposed to live. We're not supposed to soak up all the blessings. We're supposed to be bearing fruit. Israel, Jesus came and he said, I've given you all these blessings. You're just soaking up all the blessings and you're bearing fruit for yourself. 
You're not bearing fruit for me. And he says here in chapter 4, verse 28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's the right motive to work. In order to labor with your hands, not stealing, not selfishness, not greediness, but working with your hands, something that's good, good work, so that you can have to give to others. We mentioned that last Sunday night. And then it talks about how servants are, are employees are supposed to work in chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. There it says in chapter uh, chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 6, as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. It's God's will to do God's work. You can't be doing God's will if you're not working for Him. If you're not doing something for Him, you're out of His will. Um, but here it says, knowing that, it says in verse 7, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. So he says, do service as to the Lord. I'm going to finish with this. You might say, well, I don't want to be a servant, you know, but what did Jesus come as? Jesus came as a servant, didn't he? Jesus was the ultimate servant. He said in Mark uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. To be a minister, to be a servant. He came to be a servant. The whole book of Mark's about that. The whole book of Mark. Forty times in the book of Mark it says, And immediately, and immediately, and immediately. He did this, and this, and this. He was always on the move. Jesus never let the grass grow under his feet. Jesus never procrastinated. Jesus never backed down. He was always working. You know, of course, there were times where he took the Sabbath rests, where he, he woke up early to pray, and he recharged his physical batteries, but he always had this something impelling him to, he knew the time that he had. He knew that he had those three and a half years to do his ministry. <coughs> and over and over, he said, mine hour has not yet come. Mine hour, and when Jesus came to him, to, uh, I'm sorry, when Mary came to Jesus, his mother, and said, can you turn this water into wine? He says, why? My, mine hour has not yet come. I'm not here to show off uh, that I'm the Messiah just yet. But he did it to show his, his glory. And then, But oh, uh, uh, over and over, I think it's, a, it's a, uh, about seven times in the book of John, he says, mine hour has not yet come. But then just before he's arrested, shortly before he's arrested in chapter 12, he says, mine hour has come. In chapter 17, right before he's about to be arrested, he finally says, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Jesus said that. He was looking at all that he'd done, all the miracles, all the preaching. He finished the work God gave him to do. He wasn't just here wandering around through life. He had a work to do. He said, I'm not here to do my own will. I'm here to do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And if Jesus, the God the Son, can submit to God's will and God's work, then us lesser servants should definitely be able to submit to God's will and God's work. We're not here to do our own thing. Jesus said, I'm not here to do my own thing. I'm here to do the will of him who sent me. And as lesser servants, we may we have the same mindset. In Ephesians, the verses that we started with, Paul prays for them in chapter 1, verse 18, that the, eye, the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. I pray that our eyes would be enlightened, that we could know the hope of our calling, that we could know the riches of our inheritance as saints, and that we could realize what he's doing in our lives, the working of his mighty power. That's what, let's, let's finish with John chapter 9, verse 4. John chapter 9, verse 4. Here comes, in John chapter 9, this blind man. Paul, Paul prayed to the Ephesians, I pray that your eyes will be enlightened. Well, here's a blind man in John chapter 9. 
And they asked, Who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that made him born blind? Jesus said, It was neither this man or his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The works of God. God is working. Look at verse 4. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. He says, I, this man was born blind. Why? So that the works of God could be manifested in him. You and I, we are born spiritually blind. Like the, ama the song Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but now I see. And God's doing this amazing work in opening our blind eyes. And he, the, the works of God are manifest in you if you're a Christian. God's done an amazing work in your life. And then you should turn around and work for God. Just like Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. So he did it. But then look at the last part of the verse. The night cometh when no man can work. And then he's not just talking about himself. He's talking about all of us are involved in God's work. No one can work then. That includes you and me. There's a night coming when none of us will be able to do God's work. But he says, I must work the works of him that sent me. There's an assignment of work each one of us has. He says, while it is day, there's an allotment of time that we all have. We all have an assignment. We all have an allotment of time. We should all move into action. The night cometh when no man can work. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this message from the Bible of urgency, of the time that we have. Father, we know that our time is short. Help us not to worry about things that don't matter. Help us to realize that there's an eternity coming. And help us to get our priorities in line with, your, with you and your work. Help us to realize there's an amazing work that we get to be a part of. But we can't do it on our own. We know that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, he said, My meat is to do the work of him who sent me. And help us to be the same way. Help us to realize that the thing that drives us, that gives us energy, that gives us fulfillment in life, our meat is to do your work. And it's so fulfilling. Father, I pray that you'll help us to realize that uh, we can't do it on our own, though, that it's your work that makes us a Christian, and it's your work in our lives that makes us into a servant. Make us into those today. If there's someone who's not here, who's never put their faith in Christ, may they come to you and be made a saint by your grace. And if there's someone here who's a Christian who's trying to do it in their own strength, make them into a real servant for you. May that be all of our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing page 439.